Welcome back. I, of course, am having a hard time remembering which button to press because, yay. The, I will get you your tests back tomorrow at lab time. There's, um, the last one will be taken before lab tomorrow. I automatically graded by hand the last three problems anyone who missed two out of the three or three out of the three. If you only missed one out of the three, I didn't automatically grade it. When you get it back, you know, look at it and determine if you think you should ask me or not. And I will gladly do that if you ask. I just figured people who missed two or three would be very likely to raise the grade. And I think all but two people did. So the, um, the average score went up quite nicely after doing that, which made me feel generally good about things or better about things, I should say. Um, since you don't have the test back yet, there's really no <laughs> any questions on that. We've now finished talking about dynamics, about what causes things to move. And so that brings the end to the mechanics part of physics. Mechanics is studying the, um, the motion and forces and whatnot on objects. So we're starting new material today. Because of that, in 15 minutes or so, I will pass out the same test that we took the very first lab of the semester. And you'll take it a second time. And the purpose of this is to see how much you've learned. And once again, to encourage you to do your best, it will give you some extra credit up to half a point extra credit on your final or half a percent extra credit in the final grade of the class. So, you know, it's, it's not a large amount, but it is enough that hopefully people will try to do their best rather than say, I'm going to tank and make it look like you didn't teach me anything. <laughs> Cause I mean, I want to see if students are learning or not. That's one of the very important parameters for a teacher. Okay. So starting a new section, we're going to start today and just introduce phases of matter. And virtually everyone knows the basic phases of matter. And then some people will argue, well, this one should be considered basic as well. Traditionally, the three basic phases of matter are solid, liquid, and gas. What differentiates them is, of course, an important physics slash chemistry idea. So, Obvious questions here, just blurt out the obvious answer. What phase would something like this be? Or do you even know what this means? I should start with that. Okay, this is solid. This is atoms that are fixed in place with forces that, to a first approximation, we treat as spring forces. In fact, every now and then, chemistry teachers will come and borrow some magnets just so they can illustrate what the bond forces are like. They're not linear forces like a spring. Remember, springs, the equation for force is force is equal to minus kx. The minus sign, because it will come back to its equilibrium position if you displace it from there. K is the constant that tells you how strong the force is, if you will. And x is how much you displace it from equilibrium. The reason we use that for chemical bonds is not because it's correct, but because for the small motions of the atoms, you can approximately linearize it. In fact, for any force, if you have a small enough motion, you can approximately linearize it. So we use that idea a lot, the idea of the spring force. So this here would be an illustration of a crystal, a crystalline solid. Crystalline solids are solids where the atom positions are very reproducible. You go X amount of distance and you'll have the atom again. X amount of distance, you'll have atom again. And so that's what a crystalline solid is. Not all solids are crystalline. Some are amorphous, where the atoms don't have nice repeating positions. They're just kind of jammed in there. The difference fundamentally is how quick you cooled it. If you take a, well, let's say a silicate material, silicon dioxide, your 
basic chemical formula for silica, SiO4, and other cases. Um, but if you take it and you cool it very rapidly, there's not time for the atoms to migrate into their lowest energy configurations, which would be a nice crystalline lattice. And so you get, with very rapid cooling, an amorphous solid. In that case, we would call it, okay, now I have to think. What's that stuff we have? Stuff we make in your arrowheads? Or they, they made, we don't. Um, what is it? Something my mind went blank. I was thinking of when I started that sentence. The, the sharp rock that you can cut yourself with real easily if you're not careful. Obsidian. Yeah, obsidian. Thank you. Obsidian is simply the result of cooling a rock very, very fast. Obsidian often will form when you have like molten magma going into water. The water will take heat away very rapidly and result in rapid freezing, and it's glassy. Glasses are amorphous solids. They're things that froze rapidly. If you freeze it more slowly, then you have time for atoms to go to lower energy configurations and form a repeating crystal. And so if you freeze a rock very slowly, you get something like granite. With granite, you can look at it with the naked eye. You can see crystals that are maybe a meter large in size mixed together. Those crystals form because of the slower cooling. So solids, all of the atoms are held in place. One position. But they do vibrate some. Temperature is a measurement that, well, what you generally think of as temperature, I'm not going to say what you think of because a lot of you might know more, is that temperature is simply measurement, is it hot or is it cold? But temperature is actually a much more complicated measurement. It's a measurement that is proportional to the average kinetic energy of the atoms. That proportionality differs from one material to another. So it's not a constant proportionality. But for instance, in this meter stick, if I were to double the temperature using the proper scale, I'd probably be on fire. Um, but if I were to double the temperature and it didn't change phase, um, the atoms on average would have high, um, twice as big kinetic energy. So temperature is telling you about the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So as long as something has a temperature that's not absolute zero, the lowest temperature possible, the atoms are moving. And furthermore, quantum mechanics says that you can never actually stop the atoms. It's a funny thing to call them mechanics. So if you heat up the temperature of a solid, these atoms move more and more. Well, just like with a mass hanging on a string, a spring, excuse me, if you stretch the spring far enough, it'll break. And so if you stretch these springs, these bonds far enough, they will break. And when they break, then the atom can break away from its fixed position. So as you raise the temperature, you get atoms moving fast enough that they will break away from the fixed position and go into our next stage, which is the liquid. In a liquid, the atoms are still held together as a group because there's lower energy with the atoms together than if you separate them. So the atoms are in a group, but now they're moving freely past each other, bouncing off of each other. So liquid, the atoms are at a higher temperature. They broke free. They had too much energy to stay in the fixed positions. But they don't have enough energy to break away from the rest of the atoms completely. Well, if you raise temperature, they go faster. So you get to the temperature where they have enough energy to break away completely. And then you have a gas. James. Um. So if the, whatever the substance or state is, um, mm -hmm. if it's warmer, it, the atoms move more, but that's not to be confused with, uh, like if the atoms are moving, the temperature rises. Like for example, if you blow air. Um, okay, one, one is a, a macroscopic, the motion of the atoms, or excuse me, the blowing of air, and one's a microscopic, but they are fundamentally the same thing. Um, it's just, when you blow air, you're not going to cause very much change in the motion of the atoms in, this, in a solid, for instance. Okay. But it, it is fundamentally the same thing. So it does raise the temperature slightly? Very, very, very <laughs> slightly. And there's other effects that probably are going to lower the temperature. Because you have um, molecules that have a high enough energy to break away. 
Well, those are the fastest moving ones, which means they're the hottest ones. So when molecules break away, the temperature remaining goes down because the highest temperature, the fastest moving ones, leave. Usually those will come back down, but if you blow, they don't have a chance to come back and rejoin. And so if you, that's why on a, on a hot day, when you're all sweaty and glistening with sweat, when there's a breeze, you feel really cool. Because that breeze will take, you know, a lot of molecules are leaving you, other ones are coming in. If you have a breeze, it blows away the ones that left you, so they can't come back. And so you have a net cooling effect. So there's, it gets complicated, right? And so if, if you're blowing air, like say through a blow dryer, it's not that you're, the air's motionless and that you're moving it, you're just directing the motion. Um, the blow dryer is directing very fast moving molecules at your hair. So the molecules themselves are moving very fast, and as you put, blow it on your hand, you feel, oh, that's hot. That's because the molecules themselves are moving fast. The speed of the air is very small. That's the speed that you're blowing. Very small compared to the speed of the molecules. Which is why your blowing is going to have very minimal effect, because it's not very fast speed. Even though it may seem fast to you. I mean, it should seem fast to you. Okay, so that's the difference in the three fundamental phases of matter. Now, I said the three fundamental. We have some more terms we can use. So here I put four. The fourth one, a plasma. Or actually, I put four additional. A plasma is an ionized gas. How many people have not taken general chemistry? I know at least one. You're the only one? OK. <laughs> nice. Um, so in general chemistry, of course, you spend a lot of time talking about atoms and ionization states and whatnot. An ionized gas is a gas where you have added or taken away an electron from the molecules. And of course, if you have high temperatures and things are hitting each other hard, you're very likely to have electrons knocked away. So a plasma is typically a positively charged because it's missing electrons. Positive. <coughs> molecules. And in that case, you're going to have an electrostatic or electrodynamic in this case, repulsion between the nuclear the molecules. And so that's what makes a plasma behave differently than a normal gas. A normal gas doesn't have any repulsion. You only have interactions basically when they hit each other. Whereas ionized gas, if they get close, there's a repulsion, so they behave differently. So a lot of people talk about a plasma as a fourth step state of matter that's a common state. Why common? Well, the sun is a plasma. Hence, we have the, they might have giant replacements of the sun. The sun is a massive incandescent gas to the sun is a miasma of incandescent plasma. Which three of you will be learning soon. Okay, we'll sing that for everyone else if they need it. Glass here I've already talked about. It's an amorphous solid instead of a crystalline solid. And there I had the word obsidian for me, <laughs> a common naturally occurring glass. Glass back there, similar idea, just made out of different things. It's not pure silica, you know, have like soda lime ga glass, they put in impurities. If it was pure glass, it'd be a quartz glass. Quartz is pure silica. Um, Liquid crystals. Liquid crystals are very cool. They're liquid, but they're crystal. Crystal meant that you had specific positions for the atoms. Liquid means they can flow. So it's a very unique state where you have a fluid. It can flow, but you still have atoms in a repeatable structure. We use liquid crystals in our calculators or my new watch. I won't make, make you tell you what time it is, even though it is time for me to quit. Um, the liquid crystals that we use in our watches are very cool because of polarization effects. So when we talk about light next semester and polarization, we'll talk about the liquid crystals and how that works. Um, another one here, a colloid, that's a suspension where you have one type of molecule suspended in another. This picture here is milk. Milk is essentially a watery serum with little fat globules suspended in it. And those little fat globules cause me scattering to give it its white 
milky color. So that's a colloid. This here is a picture of obsidian. This is a picture of a common, <laughs> two common plasmas. You've seen these kind of desk toys here. You have a highly charged thing in the center. Um, actually, it's going back and forth, positive, negative charge, creating a plasma inside. And you see those little arcs through the plasma. And then this is a gas tube here that has a plasma inside giving off the light. Okay, it's time for me to end there. We just introduced different states of matter. Any questions before I go on to our fun extra credit test? It's totally fun. Okay. Um, this, of course, is just something to write with and nothing else. I actually, I should have left them in tables and let you take them down, pass them around. I took these to order by table. So, I don't know. Let me pass this out. I was going to pass this out before class, but I ended up working out a problem first. Um, is it 14? Oh, wow. I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> What exactly? Okay. And when I give you the test, go ahead and start. Uh, it's supposed to be a 30 minute. When you're done, just go ahead and leave. Uh, remember, please do not write the test form. I need those back at the end. Thank you.